Pleasure for me to uh, introduce uh, Professor Vigo Hanston, our speaker today. Um, he works at the Institute of Social Theoretical Astrophysics uh, at the University of Oslo. Uh, the Solar Physics Group at uh, ITA has recently been selected as a center of excellence, and now it's called the Roseland Center for Solar Physics, right? Um, uh, Vigo uh, did his uh, PhD thesis in Oslo in uh, 1991 and uh, after that he uh, moved to uh, the High Altitude Observatory in Colorado in, in the States uh, as a postdoc. He stayed there for one year and then uh, he returned to Norway and came back to uh, to Boulder uh, at the HAO uh, in uh, 1995, I think. And after that, you returned uh, uh, to, to Oslo, where you got your uh, a permanent position there. Um, he's been uh, at the Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics uh, since then. He's been uh, the vice director of the Institute several times. And for the last four years, he's been the uh, director. Uh, he just finished his term and uh, this year, 2017, he's uh, on sabbatical stay with us uh, in Granada. Um, his uh, research interests are uh, solar magnetic fields, uh, chromospheric and coronal heating, and uh, numerical simulations of the solar atmosphere. Uh, he's mainly a, a numerical guy, but he has a lot of uh, expertise uh, on observations. And actually, he's been uh, oh, he's co i on several space missions, including SOHO, uh, including Hinode. He's uh, uh, very active um, as a member of the EIS uh, team. He's also the chief observer, planning the observation. Uh, more recently, uh, he uh, became co-high of the IRIS uh, mission, the NASA mission. Um, he's most, uh, he's very well known for uh, having developed uh, the Bifrost uh, code together with Mats Carlson. Uh, this code is a uh, um, uh, MHD code capable of simulating the whole solar atmosphere uh, from below the photosphere up to the corona, it's the only, or it's the first a code capable of dealing such a uh, wide range of uh, conditions. And uh, almost everyone uh, working with uh, iris data uh, uses these uh, simulations. Uh, very recently he received the Artowski Medal uh, of the National Academy of Sciences, um, which is a very prestigious uh, prize uh, with uh, uh, also a, a very good uh, it's a, a very good amount of money okay and uh, well I think uh, this is all what, uh, what I wanted to say he's going to talk today about bombs and flares at the surface and lower atmosphere of the sun thank you thank you very much Luis um, I have to say one thing and that is that I shared the prize with Mats Carlson so I, I didn't get all the money myself. <laughs> Did I forget that? Yes, you forgot that. All right. So, um, it's good to be here, but uh, sometimes one remembers the, the homeland, and one of the things that you get when you live far north is that you see that the northern skies are sometimes green. 
And that has led a lot of Norwegians to, uh, especially towards the north, and that's led a lot of Norwegians to think about what in the world is going on. And of course, the, the answer to the question is that uh, it's the sun that is, that is pushing a bunch of plasma into the Earth's magnetosphere and, and causing this, this uh, emission of light. And essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the Earth and I'm going to go back to the sun and explain what sort of problems we have dealing with this, when we're dealing with the sun and, and why it's giving us these strange effects on, on, on the planet. So we can start with the basics. And I guess the most basic thing is that the sun is a star and it's sort of halfway into its life. If you can imagine that the life of a star starts somewhere as a cloud over here, then goes through a phase where it's, it's rotating rapidly, generates a lot of magnetic field. Then the rotation rate eventually slows because I guess the magnetic field works as a sort of a break in the interaction with the, with the interstellar medium in some sense. And it'll slow down and that, that happens with the magnetic activity as well. And at some point in, in the not exactly near future, but at some point in the future, we can imagine that the sun will become as boring as non-solar physicists think it is. So there will be no magnetic field at all to, to, to give us any excitement and we can probably retire. <laughs> and then of course more excitement happens, but that's more like four or five billion years in the future. All right, so we have a middle-aged sun, it's generating a magnetic field, which generates activity and excitement at the Earth. And the question is why or how, where do we get this field? So we can see that the sun, it spews out these coronal mass ejections and flares and things that fill interplanetary space with, with magnetic bubbles. These are the ones that interact with the Earth. And the source of that is, of course, the solar corona, which is filled up with loops of all sorts and, and activity. You see here that this is probably on a time scale of some week or something like that. We see that the, the magnetic activity is quite... You can see regions of, uh, regions of field that are, that are more or less in the same place, but that they are active. Things are going on. There's, there's changes and excitement. And if we focus in a little bit more, we see that this kind of excitement leads to, of course, the spewing out of material that, that goes into the corona and, on, and onwards. And this sort of activity happens on many scales, also smaller scales as those accessible by, for example, the IRIS instrument. This is an image embedded in a larger instrument which is taking a picture of the whole sun. Then this instrument is, the IRIS one is one that can concentrate on a small bit. And we can see that if we look at this, we can see both the small scale things here and then the larger scale explosion at the same time. So we have activity going on on small scales and on huge scales. And this is something we have to understand if we're going to understand the, understand the totality of, um, of the solar magnetic process. So, what do we want to do? Let's, let's try to set up a program for this talk. Let's say we have a starting point, and that is that this, the corona is filled with, with magnetic loops. And those loops, they are in the corona. We know that the, the energy content or the energy density of the field is much, much higher than the, than the energy density in the plasma. So the, the magnetic field dominates everything. On the other hand, if we go down to the photosphere, we see that the opposite is true. Here it's the gas dynamics that controls what's going on and it's pushing the field around. And then we're left with some questions. I mean, just as a basic starting point. And one of the question is, how in the world is this generated? Where in the world is it generated? How is it generated? And where and why does it appear in the photosphere? And once in the photosphere, how is it moving around? It's being shoved around by the, by the various uh, effects of, well, we'll get to it, of convection. Uh, but what can the movement of the field in the photosphere, what can it tell us? And this is where, for example, Louise is, is an expert. And Again, once in the photosphere, how does the field continue up, through the, photo, up through, through the photosphere and into the upper atmosphere? How does that occur? And how is the coronal field formed? Because it's not quite obvious that the field just goes boop, through the surface and gets out. It has to get there somehow, and we have to look into that process. And finally, once we get there, how do we convert the energy that's in the field, how do we convert that into heat, to heat the, the chromosphere and the, and the corona? So those are the basic questions, I think I've covered most of them, that we need to cover in, when we're doing solar physics. But of course, that's way too much to cover in this talk. So I'm going to concentrate on this one. 
how does field get into the atmosphere and how is the coronal field formed? But I'll give a short introduction to some of these other things too because they, they fit in. I mean, these questions hang together. All right, so let's begin with the bait. Yes? Tell us what is for you the upper atmosphere. Okay, that's, when, when we look at the sun, then, then the, the region we see with our, with our eye, let's call it that, that's the photosphere, right? And I'm saying, for me, the upper atmosphere is everything above that region. Okay. Yeah. So that encompasses the chromosphere, what we call the transition region, and also the corona. Okay. So for me, that's the upper atmosphere. And in some ways, it makes sense. Uh, I may get back to that, why that's a, a, a good combination, but, but okay. All right. So let's, let's go to the basics here. Here's an image of, of the corona. This is about one million degree hot gas. But of course, if we want to know how the field is generated, we need to look inside the sun and then processes going on there. And I'm sure you remember this from some point in your education. The sun consists of the core, and this is where energy is being generated through nuclear fusion. This energy has to leak out, or it does leak out over a time, on a time scale of some, something like 100,000 to a million years. In the beginning, this happens slowly in the radiative zone. Or, sorry, where the photons are popping around like this and, and slowly diffusing out. But at some point, it becomes more efficient for, uh, for the energy to be carried through the motions of convection. So that becomes more efficient, and what's more efficient is what happens. So that's um, the process. That's one of the processes that is very important in the generation of the field. Of course, we have one more process, which has to be mentioned. Oh, sorry, the chromosphere corona. And that is that the sun rotates differentially, i.e. that it rotates more rapidly at the equator than it does at the poles. And exactly why that happens is a good question that hasn't been answered properly yet. But we think that is also a major ingredient for why the, the, the sun is capable of regenerating a magnetic field. All right. Now I've talked about a little bit about that the, the solar magnetic field is organized on small scales and on big scales, but this is also true when it comes to, and I've shown you time variations on, on down to a few, actually a few seconds or hours, but if we look on a longer time scale, we'll see that the solar, the, the solar magnetic field also is variable on a much longer time scale, which is probably also well known here at this institute, and that is on the order of of 10 or decades. So we see that the, the, the number of sunspots varies on an 11 year cycle, something like this, with, and it's, it's within some sort of envelope of perhaps long, even longer scale uh, um, variations, and that, the field, and that the sunspots show up at high latitudes and then slowly go towards the equator, and then we begin a new cycle, and the same thing recurs again. So clearly, or at least clearly, what I guess one could clearly on the back of an envelope, one can say this is it's obvious that there must be some sort of global mechanism that's regenerating this field, something that is working on a global scale and on a time scale of decades. And this has, of course, been well known since the I don't know 1890s or something like that. And the basic ideas of how this can come about are called the, the solar dynamo. So, one of the things, and it's, uh, it's often converted into, let's say, two separate processes. One is how do we take given poloidal field, i.e. field that looks something like this, on the sun, how do we convert that into toroidal field, i.e. field that goes around the sun? That's, that's the one question we need to answer. And once we've managed that, how do we go again from toroidal to poloidal? And again, this is something that um, people thought was solved in the, in the uh, late 70s through, uh, well, Gene Parker, who is a very famous solar physicist, came up with a basic idea called the omega alpha dynamo. The omega effect is that the differential, equa uh, differential rotation will cause field lines to be dragged around the sun so that since it uh, rotates more rapidly here than here, 
and we can sort of wind up the, the field lines like this around the sun. So we generate a, uh, a toroidal field. And then the next question is, how do we generate a poloidal field? And that has been quite a bit trickier. And what Parker came up with was the so-called alpha effect. And he said, well, if you look at the details, there's some asymmetries with how fields are made according to latitude. And those slight asymmetries combined with reconnection can actually lead us to a regeneration of, i.e. when the field comes up, it twists slightly because of Coriolis sources and this sort of thing. And then you get reconnection and you can regenerate a field that looks some more poloidal. That was his idea. And that was uh, developed further by people, in, especially in Eastern Germany, using the so-called mean field theory and things like this. And it seemed one had a pretty good case for, for getting this to work. The problem is that when one started making models and starting also getting in information from helioseismology, it turned out that the forms of motions one needed to keep this, uh, this dynamo model working didn't fit at all with what one was measuring as, as how the rotation, for example, for example, the rotation of the sun varied with depth. So some of this, these things had to be thrown away or it just is very difficult to get it to work. And what one did then was one went back to another type of model called the babcock lighten model. Hmm. Oh, there it is, sorry. Where one works with field, uh, when, when these field lines rise up and through the convection zone and into the photosphere, then they are, there's a slight asymmetry due, again, due to the Coriolis force, which causes the field lines close to the equator, they will diffuse across and, and destroy each other, and a little bit of the sun uh, polar field will then uh, preferentially go to the north and south pole and rebuild the, the poloidal field. It's at a very low efficiency, but you don't need that much efficiency to get it to work. So this is one of the ideas that that's been was thrown away in the 60s when, when Parker came with his idea, but now has come back. But in any case, um, one can sit and draw cartoons for ages, but if you really want to test things, you have to use a, a numerical model or analytical model to really get going and see, you know, can my, can my back of the envelope or cartoon, can it actually work in reality? And that is, I guess, the big progress that's been made the last few years is that people have been brave enough to start trying to model this numerically in, in various ways. No. I've already told you that the, dec that the time scale of the magnetic field generation is of, is of the order of decades. And that means that if you're looking at the sun and you're thinking what's going on there and you're trying to solve the hydrodynamic or magnetohydrodynamic equations, you know that if you kick the sun, the sound waves are going to be flying around inside the sun. And those have time scales that are pretty short. So if you want to model this on a time scale of several decades, you don't have a chance. So what you can do then is you can throw away the compressibility of the medium, and you can make what's called the analastic approximation. And when you do that, you also throw away the sound waves, and you can progress with much bigger time steps. So that's the process that's been used to model the sun up to almost, at least the inner parts of the sun, and up to almost the surface. When you get closer to the surface, this is not allowed. I mean, this doesn't work anymore. But at least for the, the interior of the sun, you can use this approximation. And what you get then, it's a bit, okay. as you get models that maybe look like this, this is something I've just taken from Fan, uh, Fan and Fung, or maybe it's Fung and Fan, I don't remember, uh, in 2014, where they have exactly done this sort of simulation and get something that at least is starting to look like what the sun is doing, i.e. they get the 11-year cycle, or they get cycles somewhere between 5 and 15 years, they say. They get uh, uh, the uh, differential rotation profile, looking about what helioseismology is telling them, and so on. And, in addition, they get the formation of strong flux regions that start rising towards the surface. So they've got most of the ingredients that they need in order to perhaps at least say we're we're getting close to explaining what's going on in the interior of the sun. 
so maybe uh, one is getting closer to to understanding the basics of the global dynamo i have to say though that um sometimes being on panels uh, where we look at uh, um, proposals for for uh, funding in both in norway and other places is that i've seen several of these sorts of reports and people do not agree yet on what is going on and there are things in the interior of sun that are far from understood for example the basic importance of rotation is not well understood or how important it is relative to convection and so on so this is an open field of research let's turn to another open field of research and that is the question of okay once we've got the field in the photosphere and it's being shaken around by by the the granulation and the motion of granulation how can we convert that motion into heat because we know that uh, on both so-called super granular scales i.e. things that are on the order of um, 20 megameters on the, on the sun and on smaller scales this is about 2 megameters on the sun we see that there's motions and that the magnetic field is being shoved around a lot and this means that there when you're shoving a field like this then you're generating a pointing flux that pointing flux must be going up and now the question is how do we use that pointing flux to heat the corona and this is not a new idea I'll just bring you to the date here this is Hannes Alvain's paper in 1947 and how he uses exactly this mechanism to generate, for his case, Alvain waves, of course, to, to, to heat the corona. So this has been around, how long is that? 1947, that's 60, 70, 80 years. I mean, it's, it's, it's a long time. And people are still not agreeing on how this mechanism works exactly. The basics have been in place for a long time, but we are yet to, uh, to get anywhere or to get to a conclusion on this. Okay, but again, how do we attack this problem in, in our modern day and age when we have high-quality high computers? Well, we take the equations as we think they are and, and we put them into a, a computer and then we see what happens. And what I'd like to talk about are so-called realistic models, i.e. those are models where the output of the model is something that you can compare directly to the observations. So you can run the model, you can generate an observable, and then you can compare it, at least statistically, directly with the observations. All right. And as Luis said in the introduction, there's not too many groups doing this, but there are more. So we have a, sort of our brother code in Copenhagen by Oke Norden and Klaus Galskor. There's a Japanese group that is now working very hard and getting close to this, Ijima and Yokoyama. And then there's Matthias Rempel in, at HAO. And then there's us, essentially. So, which is a good thing. There used to be only one of us, and now there's, it's slowly growing, and perhaps we'll even manage to find some disagreement, and that would be even better, I hope. All right, so this is going on. Uh, and one could ask the question, okay, you're talking about realistic models, but what in the world are you? Can we really believe you? I mean, how well can you do? And this has actually been a study because models up to the photosphere disregarding the magnetic field have been going on for quite a while, since, since the late 80s. And the question one could ask is, how, realistic, how well are you doing? I mean, can you actually, you're claiming you can reproduce this, what's going on in the sun in detail. Are you doing well? And there's, I guess the bottom line is yes at least when it comes to the photosphere. And these models have both been uh, compared with the, the real sun and with each other. And it seems that even using very different types of techniques, it turns out that the results are consistent to within a very tight degree. So at least when it comes to describing photospheric convection, this type of modeling is doing really well and can be a source of, of learning and of analysis. For example, if one wants to look at um, abundances, solar abundances, for example, then you can use these sort of models to say, okay, I'm, I'm measuring an oxygen line. What abundance does that have to be at to be at the proper place? And that, that's actually caused a slight revolution in how one computes the abundance. The abundances, because of this type of modeling, have been changed quite a bit because of, because of this. 
So it's a tool that one can use, and the hope, of course, is to extend that tool up into the higher atmosphere. And that was the, or one of the origins of, the, of this Bifrost code, and I'd just like to go through rather quickly what, what goes into the, a code like this. So we have a so-called sixth order scheme. This is not important. There's many ways of, of, of starting uh, doing numerical modeling, but in this case, we use a sixth order spatial scheme with artificial viscosity or diffusion instead of numerical viscosity or diffusion. We have open vertical boundaries, which is obvious why one should have one studying the sun because it's not the same down here as it is up there by any stretch of the imagination. So you need some sort of prescription of what does the rest of the universe look like? Well, the rest of the universe and what does the interior of the sun look like? You need some sort of prescription to describe the rest of the world. On the other hand, um, on the horizontal boundaries, you could probably pretend that things go around and come back. Okay, we would also like to have a possibility of introducing magnetic field into the bottom boundary to see what happens to it. We need some sort of a realistic equation of state, and we need to do optically thick radiative transfer, and some way of describing the radiation up in the chromosphere, which is too expensive to solve in detail in, in the chromosphere, because there's too many lines and there's too many, too many things you need to do. Unfortunately, in the corona, there's another player in the energy equation, and that is thermal conduction. This also needs to be described, and for reasons that are, will take me too long to explain, uh, this is uh, a bit of a trick, because uh, the operator for thermal conduction scales much more poorly with, with, uh, with uh, resolution than, than the other terms. So it, it it's very expensive to solve. So you need some tricks for solving this. And of course, once you get into the upper solar atmosphere, and now I'm speaking above, let's say a thousand kilometers above the photosphere or, and on, then non-equilibrium effects become important because the number of collisions between particles starts to decrease and things start to get out of so-called local thermodynamic equilibrium. So we don't know the, the state, the occupation numbers of all the different states, and we have to maybe have to compute that uh, consistently by solving some sort of rate equations. And that also goes for Ohm's law. You may need some extra terms in Ohm's law in order to understand how things go together because you have both neutrals and, and charged particles, and they will slip after a while when, when collisions become less important. All right. Um, for those of you too lazy to write your own code, because it does take time to write a code, we are also releasing the results. This is a short commercial break um, in case you're interested. And you can go to our web page and find some of the results we have of this. I won't dwell on that, but continue. Um, and say, okay, so where were we with our main story? Our main story is that we have fields coming from below, and we want to see how do we get it through the photosphere and into the, the further corona. And there are several groups who have looked at this, just uh, setting up a few here. But one of the problems with this is that the observers, and here uh, Louise may you know, arrest me or, or choke me or hit me, they don't quite agree on what the prescription of what does the field actually look like on the sun. Because it's not easy to, to, to measure the magnetic field of the sun. So what does the photospheric field actually look like? And if you look here at the well, this is since, uh, actually, I guess the big revolution came with Hinode, or one big revolution came with Hinode, is that several of these groups um, measure, did their measurements, and you see, well, predominantly horizontal, predominantly horizontal, isotropic distribution, predominantly vertical, and so on. So, at least for a while, it's been, even if the modeler, you say, am I doing, am I doing this right? Then you go back to the observer as well, can you tell me if I'm doing it right? They say, maybe. <laughs> And that, and that makes it more difficult to make proper models. All right, but I think I just read a paper from Bruce Lights that came out uh, sometime this year, and he said that, uh, or they say, that in, in that case, that the, the strong fields look like they're primar primarily vertical, while the weaker fields look like they're primarily horizontal in the, in the photosphere. But I don't know if that's the, the last part of the story or not, but at least, I, I wanted to, to say that the difficulty is that as a modeler, you really want to be, have the observers able to tell you you're doing it wrong or you're doing it right. Okay. 
So we've got a field in the corona, uh, in, I'm sorry, in the photosphere. We we'll have a convection simulation going on. And what we find then is that generally, once we have that, almost it doesn't matter what we do. We end up with a pointing flux that goes into the corona here, the photosphere is zero, and then we're going up through the, the, into, the, uh, into the corona here. And if we look at the pointing flux, it generally ends up at about 100 watts per square meter into the corona. And that's the number, roughly the number you need. Almost whatever you do, this is going to happen. So that looks like, okay, all you need is a magnetic field of some sort and to shake it, and you're going to get coronal heating. But once you've computed the pointing flux, you kind of want to look down too, below the surface. So here, the surface is a zero, as I said, and here I'm going down a, a few megameters. And what you see then is that, wow, in the convection zone, or in the top of the convection zone, there's a lot of pointing flux going down. So that means you're taking field, and your, uh, the convection flows are dragging them down and, um, and pulling the, and that gives you a uh, pointing flux going out of, the, out of the photosphere. So how do we replace this field? Well, there's two ways. One is that you have field coming up with the upflows from below, and the other is that you have a local dynamo, some sort of combination of this field that's, that, uh, the motions in the, in the upper parts, upper few megameters of the so solar convection zone that are generating fields just by motions locally. And Matthias Rempel at HO did this kind of experiment, and I'd like to quote what he says. He says, okay, if I have no field coming in from below, and he goes down to a 5, 6, or even more megameters, he says, experiments with B equals zero at the bottom boundary indicate that a small-scale dynamo restricted to the top couple of megameters of the convection zone can only explain about half of the observational inferred field. I.e., even quiet sun magnetic field requires that we have a global field that comes from below, is his conclusion here. So it seems we need two things in order to explain what's going on in the sun. We need both the global dynamo, but also this local one that's, that's continuously generating heat. How does the heating work? Sorry. All right. Now we're going to go to uh, talking about we have the field, we're in the corona. How do we how do we actually take the pointing flux that we're producing at the photospheric plates here? How do we take that pointing flux and insert it as heat into the corona? And this is a cartoon made by Gene Parker in I don't know when. It uh, doesn't really matter, but he said, okay, I'm going to take away everything that's not important, and I'm going to just look at the problem uh, as basically as I can. So I'm taking the photospheric field, which goes, let's say, the field lines are going like this, like this, and he said, well, the curvature is probably not important, so I'll just move it like that, and gravity is not important, so I'll take that away. So the only thing I'm left with are field lines that are connecting these two dots, like this, and then I'm going to take the horizontal motions of the photosphere up here and here, and I'm going to see what happens. And of course, what happens is that after a while, since you have more or less turbulent motions going on, the field lines are going to get all tangled up. And wherever they're trying to intersect and go through each other, that's where we get big currents, and those currents are going to dissipate, and that's, that's our heating. That's the basic idea. So... Essentially, my computer is slow. Here we go. So essentially, we have field lines, and I've just drawn two of them, and they're being moved around by some sort of uh, motion in the, in the photosphere. And at some point, they're going to meet each other like this and want to go through each other because they're being pulled in opposite directions. Okay, and that means that we're going to generate a current that's going to be something like this, and the amount of current we get is going to be, of course, depend on their separation, but also on the angle they meet at. So if they meet at an angle like this, you get a big current. If they meet at an angle that's very small, you get a smaller current. And the turns out that the angle they meet at, if you're just using uh, 
uh, photospheric motions is going to be pretty small. All right, but if one now takes this idea, puts it into a computer, and runs it, you find out you get some very nice effects. One is that the heating is highly episodic in time. So we get this, uh, if you look at a certain point, and you look at how does the heating go, you see that it varies very rapidly with time in all kinds of different regions. And then the question is, OK, how does that fit with what we see? So if we look at the limb of the sun, for example, and this is a line of, of silicon 4, uh, which is formed at about 100,000 degrees, we see that we get all these little small structures here along the, the limb of the sun. And the question is, is that something that we can reproduce in our models? And here is the, one of the models in the same sort of line. And we see that, indeed, we get a lot of these low-lying loop-shaped structures going on. And all of these are at about 100,000 degrees. And here we see a line profile taken through this line here, up here. So that looks pretty good. It looks like we're doing a, a pretty nice job. And if you analyze what's going on, you see that the, the model sort of consists of two things. One is these higher loops that go up here and that they have temperatures that go some uh, a million to a few million degrees, like this. So a so-called traditional coronal loop. But you also find a class of loops that never get much hotter than a few hundred thousand to a half a million degrees and that are continuously heated and cool and continuously heated and cool and so on. And if you look at it globally, you'll see that, okay, we get heat. This is heating as a function of height. And you see that the heating can, sp can spread out quite a bit along here, but it roughly follows the, the strength of the magnetic field. So we, we find heating that is... Using this braiding process, we find heating that roughly goes as a magnetic uh, energy density and yeah, leads to enough flux or enough heating that we can reproduce the corona. So, are we happy? Well, maybe. The, if you generate line profiles from this, uh, from this uh, set of models, you get something that looks a lot like the models. Often, here's some more. So here we have time going up like this, and then you have frequency along here. But what one notices after looking at these a little bit more carefully is that most of the velocities are typically less than the speed of sound. So we're getting interactions where the field lines are meeting each other. We get small explosions, but they're not generating really big velocities. And that's perhaps telling us something. Because if we do look at the observations, and look at the line profiles, we see that we get velocities of order up to 100 kilometers per second or more. And the speed of sound in, for this line is of, on the order of 30. So here we have a, a supersonic or a Mach number of something like 3, something like that. So clearly this is much beyond the speed of sound. So we're missing something in those kind of models. That very seldom happens that we get supersonic velocities. So, we need another mechanism, and that mechanism is, of course, hydrogen bombs. This is a name given to uh, a phenomenon seen in the solar atmosphere by uh, Elliman in 1917, which is exactly 100 years ago. Uh, and the name, for obvious reasons, has changed. They're now called Elliman bombs. And what he saw was here. These bright things going out here in the line of, this is H alpha, where he saw nothing in the line core. Here's another example, like this, and another one here. So what he saw was these really bright, also called mustaches by the French, that stick out in the line, and then nothing in the line core itself. And as I'm sure you all know, um, the line core is more opaque than the line uh, wings. So that means that the opaque parts, you're seeing higher up in the atmosphere. And in the, towards the wings, you're seeing deeper down in the atmosphere. And 
That means that somehow we are heating the lower parts of the atmosphere, but not the region above. And the region above for this line, which is H alpha, is, is uh, up in the chromosphere, while down below is, is in the low, very low chromosphere in the photosphere. All right, and this has been, in the 100 years that we've gone since then, people have made a lot of arguments, where is it hot, where is it not hot, and so on. And it's been, I wouldn't say it's been the most active region of solar physics the last 100 years, but it's been a continuous study where people have gotten somewhere, but not quite. But I think it was quite reinvigorated by the fact that uh, Hardy Peter in 20, uh, 2014, with the launch of, of IRIS, found a very similar phenomenon in hotter lines, i.e. silicon-4 lines that are formed at 100,000 degrees, where he, where he found evidence that there was gas at quite low in the atmosphere that was heated to at least 100,000 degrees, roughly. So, and that led to an enormous, uh, let me say, reinvigoration of this field. And what he found was that, as evidence for, that, uh, for the fact that this was very low, was that he found absorption. You see, these, this is a silicon four line. It spread out to something like 100 kilometers per second. And you find absorption. This is a nickel two absorption, which means that there's cold, this is evidence that there's cold gas on top of the hot gas. So you're doing the heating very far down in the atmosphere. Here's another example. You can see here. This is H alpha. Here is a point. Point here where you see that there's cold gas coming over here. Here's the same thing in silicon four, which is about 100,000 degrees. And we see here that there's absorption that is coming from this this point here in the atmosphere. So we have cold gas that's clearly overlying the point that's being heated. All right, and just to show you that um, things have progressed in the 100 years, this is maybe some of the best observations of Ellenbrun bombs, and you see these flickering flames here. These are what Ellenbrun bombs look like when you're looking from the side. So you see these flame-like objects, which gives a clue as to what is actually going on. All right, so how do we, how do we generate something like this, and how do we answer the question, how do we get these big velocities in the upper atmosphere? So one way of doing that is, is by saying, all right, let's see what happens, what we can do with, with flux emergence. Let's take a model and let's push through a very simple magnetic field, i.e. a straight magnetic field, into the uh, bottom of a convection zone and then see what happens. Here's a model. Here is the magnetic field strength. Here is the temp log of the temperature. Here is the temperature at a uh, horizontal cut in the uh, chromosphere. Here's the intensity in the photosphere, and then here's the intensity higher up. And what we see happens is that the, the magnetic field is rising here, hits the photosphere where it more or less stops, and, and so on. So we're getting a field, it hits the photosphere, and then it stalls. Okay, and this has been explained at least in, in the back of an envelope several times by people uh, since 1987. The field comes up, it hits the photosphere where the convection motions are stopped because the gas is no longer buoyant, so the field gets stuck, and it sort of spreads out. So we can expect that on the sun, there's a lot of field that's lying just below the photosphere and not getting out, not coming through the atmosphere. And this has been reproduced also in numerical models. All right. So how do we get out of this dilemma? How do we get the field actually into the atmosphere itself? Well, it turns out that there's an instability called the undular mode, where we have, if we have a large, uh, large enough gradient in the magnetic field, then we get what's called a Parker instability. So we have strong field and then no field. If the field gets strong enough, we can win over this, this lack of uh, uh, buoyancy, and the field will start rising here, and then the material will slide along the magnetic field lines and go down like this, and the field can rise into the atmosphere. And if you model this, you will see that what happens is that in regions where you have a slightly stronger magnetic field, you get these bubbles that rise into the upper atmosphere. So here you'll see if you look here and here, you'll see how these bubbles come up into the atmosphere. 
So here we go, the field is spreading out. And it's actually here the field is strong enough to just push the old corona aside and spread out. All right. So now the question is, what happens when you get several bubbles and they start interacting? Well, the field was originally straight, and then you're getting something coming up here and something coming up here. And if you think about it, you'll see that the, when the field lines are bent over and meet again, they'll be oppositely directed. So that means that's a perfect situation for starting reconnection. So this is sort of the cartoon. You have field lines popping up here, coming up here, and they will push. They're trying to fill all of space, and they'll meet. And that's a good situation for reconnection. So here is a cut of what happens in the photosphere. Magnetic field, temperature, velocity. And we see here that there are regions where opposite directed magnetic fields meet. And just to give you a point of a detail, so the field lines are meeting here, and you see here that we get this small little region of, of brightening. So the field is, is heating up, or I'm sorry, the, the gas is being heated up. So we get strong field concentrations, very low temperatures around here, this black region here, and that's because the, the field is convecting, I mean the, the plasma is convecting and collapsing. We get strong dome flows, this redshifted stuff here, where the field is strong, and then we get the field when it meets, we get reconnection, and we get heating in that little region where reconnection is going on. If we look at this from the side, you see here, here is the current sheet. You see zero field along here. Here's the temperature, the density, the velocity, and this is just a, a measure of the current. If I show this as a movie, you see here, and it's easiest to see here, you see a jet forming. So you get reconnection jet, you get field uh, material that's being pushed up and being pulled down, or pushed down. And you see some slight heating here. And if we take and generate an image of H alpha in this, you'll see that, again, we get these flame-like structures sticking up out of the photosphere that look very much like what you have on the sun itself. So this looks like this is a good explanation of what the sun is actually doing, that you have reconnection in the photosphere, and that is actually generating these, these flame-like structures. And in fact, if you look at the HF Align profile, you see that the modeled ones have these mustaches or moustaches. So, clearly something nice is going on there. But you also see that you have regions in silicon 4 where you have very bright emission. So, in addition to getting stuff in the H alpha, you have other things going on in much hotter lines. And then you can analyze, or we, can, we have analyzed what's going on, and we find out that it's not only in the photosphere where we generate this sort of reconnection, but also at greater heights, at 1.3 and 1.8 megameters above. So at various heights, this is going on. So the field is, is coming up through the photosphere. They're meeting each other, but the point of meeting can be different, and it can happen at different heights. And, yeah, as explained here, so what we see is that originally we had a flat field that was coming in like this, but then when it breaks through the photosphere, it breaks through the photosphere in small regions, and those regions, they, they hit each other, and then they reconnect, and steadily we build up longer and longer field lines. So this is perhaps the way that the sun is building up, starting with small scale loops, then building them together, then building them together, and so on, Eventually, we build these long corona loops that we see in the corona. All right, here is an image of H alpha, and at least I've managed to convince myself these are very short movies because they're very expensive to make. This H alpha that you make these uh, fibro-like ribbons that you see in the observations. Also here. All right, so what have we managed to do here? 
Well, there's a cartoon of how these element bombs were made. This has been sort of the cartoon that's been going for a while. And you get these so-called serpentine field lines, and eventually you make the longer arch filament type structures. And essentially what I spent the last year doing or so is found out that in addition, you probably get the, the construction of, of, uh, of UV bursts at greater heights, because this process is happening at several heights. So to explain element bombs, these UV bursts and so on, is probably, or in very high probability, is the effect of reconnection as field is trying to break through the photosphere and make longer and longer loops that, that are eventually going to, to form the coronal field. And this is the point I should stop. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Vigo. Um, are there questions or comments? It's a very naive question from a non solar Good. Guy. So, what percentage of, of the, the sun's energy output is in the magnetic field? And if I think it is like a million, a billion. Oh. And would that lead to appreciable slowdown still? Um, let me see. It depends a little bit on. I mean, there, it, it, if you look at the numbers of the pointing flux going, for example, being dragged down, then it's actually several percent of the of the uh, solar luminosity is in the form of, or is the pointing flux going down is is on the order of several percent of the magnetic field. So the magnetic field is actually uh, big enough to do to make some importance to the to the, to the sun. I mean, it is a certain amount, but I think that the total percentage. I don't have that that number in my head. But clearly, I mean, it's it's important for the uh, for the also for the long term evolution of the, of the of the of the sun itself because it's it's changing it's changing the rotation rate, for example. I mean, just the, the reason. The fact that we have a magnetic field that's, that's stretching its arms out and, and sort of being braced by the interstellar medium is, you know, it's, it's a big change to this one. But is that measurable? Measurable? The breaking of the sun's rotation? Uh, to to I think by analogy, at least, by looking at the solar light stars and seeing that yeah, the young ones are. are uh, we know roughly that, I mean, you can probably use the, the amount of, of mass flux that's being taken away by the solar wind. And I think the time scale is, you guess from that is on the order of, I would guess, billions of years or several hundred million years, something like that. So I mean, it's not exactly the most rapid process in the, in the universe. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, which is a connection, if any, between the models of the sun interior and those that you made when you want to reproduce the Hellstrom Blossom Dragon, these very crude and physical assumptions for the convective uh, transport in the star interior, particularly non adiabatic convection, yeah. you make these amazing length things yeah. and so on. If you want to produce very big um, many yeah. ages, then you have to do some simplifying things. Yes. But you, how could you, I, I'm asking, get some recipes or rules or knowledge from these very detailed models to, to put in the whole evolutionary calculations to improve them and avoid these simplifications? Yes, I think, well, not avoid the simplifications, but justify the simplifications, I think, is, is the secret, or tweak the simplifications. And I think that's a project that, that's already been done. I mean, people are, are looking into, okay, a convex, taking convection simulations, some few convection simulations, and saying, does, for example, mixing length theory give you the right answer, or how do I have to change it in order to, to make it work better, I guess. So I, I, I think you can, I think there's a very important interplay between the, the high let's say high resolution, high cost simulations that where you're looking into all the details and, and these recipes that, 
like you say, one really needs if one wants to look at 10 billion stars or whatever. It has been done, or it's being done? It's being done, I would say. But not by me, and that's the reason no. I'm not giving you a better answer. No, I was expecting you to say, what, ask people who need this. <laughs> yeah. Doing the other thing. Yeah. But, I mean, thank, you for the, and thank you for the talk, which was very nice. Thank you. Yeah, I have a couple of questions on your previous slide. Uh, you Can you go back to the previous one? I just make sure. Uh, what would you have shown about the whole thing? Uh, I have several cartoons, but uh, which one? This one? Uh, no, I think it was the whole thing where it actually for main thing. Ah, yes. In the photosphere and then coming along for the long okay. yeah. So what we have at the end, the arc filament, is it the, is it the coronal map ejection? <coughs> no, I, or this no? Is, no, I would say this, in this, I mean, this is a cartoon, and it's, it's kind of funny because um, this is a cartoon made by uh, Kazunari Shibata in the 80s, and then uh, Brigitte Schmider and, and Etienne Pariat added some things, and then I, yeah. I, I added my little bit. Anyway, I think the basic idea originally was that this is just a coronal loop of some sort. So if, to get a mass ejection, then I think you have to push another system like this and push them together or bring up some new flux beside it and something too, because this is a very stable structure. Okay. This one here, it's stuck. So you, in order to disrupt this one and make a ma uh, mass, uh, coronal mass ejection, you have to bring up some other system of flux, let's say over here, that oh, you know is oriented in the right way to, to release the, the fluid. Okay. Yeah. So I was a little bit confused because I was assuming that was a big portion yeah. of what no, I was so I mean, with the coronal mass ejection. So, so in this talk, I didn't address the question of the big ejection at all. Okay. Yeah. So, but I, I mean, but for me, the question, uh, all right, at least what I was hoping to, to portray is that actually just getting the field from here and up to this state is right. needs some explaining. Um, um, do you have an idea which is the time scale that for taking that information from the bottom to the top? Uh, I would guess days. Yeah. Days. Right. So yeah. that something which is okay. Well, I have another two questions, but, yeah. Yeah, but no, it was actually re related with the coronal mass ejection. Ah, okay, one, okay. But because yeah. it's not that topic, it doesn't really apply. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, I have one. Uh, we got um, Ellerman bones um, are observed mainly in active regions or regions where uh, magnetic flux is uh, emerging uh, quite intensively. Yes. Do you think? But but these these regions are very localized and uh, they cover only a small fraction of the total solar surface. Do you think the same process occurs uh, in the quiet sun in the rest of of the surface? I guess the, the correct answer for me would be say, I don't know. But I, I would like to say that um, a person you also know, Luke Ruppe, he told me that they had made some observations at the Swedish Tower and they found some things that looked like element bombs also in, in some quiet sun emission. So I think that it's worth looking at, let's say, for, to see if you can find at least some small element type, element bomb type things also in the quiet sun. And I'd be a little bit surprised if you never got it outside because I've, I have a hard time understanding uh, that this field, which I'm pretty sure is lying there, somewhere between the photospheric so there's a lot of field in the quiet sun as well. And I'd be surprised if it never breaks through and, and, and does this sort of process, I guess. It's, it's but one question would be, uh, can you detect the reconnection in the photosphere uh, as a brightening, or maybe as a velocity enhancement uh, by directional jet? I think it's probably easier to detect it as a brightening. It would be my guess. In the photosphere. In the photosphere. Yeah. I mean, or in the in the wings of H alpha is one, is one possibility. But, but there might be other signatures that I I don't know. I mean, this is something one could actually sit down and think. Okay, where where should one look? I, there, I, I'm not really sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Probably apply the question. I'm not really sure. Anyway, I would like to make.
the question again. Uh, a good, how that could be, how efficient or how important compared with the different age of the sun? I mean, if people are thinking about now that they're talking about the exoplanet and a bit of also in the yeah. world, they are thinking about that the earlier stage of the sun, they were really more active and they would put in yeah. the exoplanet and so on. So I wonder whether they have more efficient at the different stage of the life of the sun. Actually, that's a, that's a pretty interesting question uh, that I don't know the answer to. But uh, the reason I think it's interesting is I heard a talk in last November by someone who said that they'd been doing studies of solar-like stars and they found out that often they came in two separate classes. You had things that were like the sun and you had uh, a set of, of, of stars that looked like they were roughly the same age that were um, quite a bit more active. So it may be that um, the sun is close to a state where it becomes more active or less active and that, I mean to me it sounds like, okay, maybe there's a big difference because we it looks like we have two separate dynamos, perhaps, right? We have the global one and the local one, and maybe on some stars, you know, they, they, they work together in, the, in a slightly different way, or that they are, uh, only one of them is, uh, is active, or so on. And I think that's a, that would be a very interesting thing to look into, is to see, you know, is this, is this actually the case? But I've been, it's not really my field, but I've been surprised at how little people know about, for example, the importance of rotation. Uh, that they, they don't agree yet. And I would have thought, you know, this is something that was solved 100 years ago, but no. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, I think uh, we should thank him again. And uh, um, he will stay with us for uh, the rest of the year. Uh, his office is in, in this building uh, on the first floor, if you want to talk to him. Um, in more detail we can do it. So thank you very much. Thank you.